Good morning. Welcome to our service as we continue our celebration of Christmas and rejoice in the birth of our Savior. A welcome hymn, Christ the Lord to us with all.
our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading is from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices, together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has laid bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. This is the word of the Lord. We take out the insert, we join in singing Psalm 98. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to Titus, chapter 2. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. This is the word of the Lord. We sing him 43 on page 3.
Please stand to honour the Gospel of the Lord. We read from John's Gospel, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave him the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, The text for our first meditation is John 3.16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Christmas means different things to different people. To children, it means presents. To older people, it means that the family will come and visit. To others, it simply means a day off from work. To those who are more philosophical, it may mean the hope of peace between nations, working towards an end of poverty and social injustice, an expression of love for all mankind. For the true meaning of Christmas is not found in the feelings and philosophies of people, but in the inspired word of God. It's in the Bible that we find the true meaning of Christmas. And so this morning, let's turn to the scriptures and see what God has to say about the meaning of Christmas. The first truth that we learn from God's word is that Christmas means God is love. Some people see God as only a vengeful God, a God who gets some kind of pleasure out of causing pain and suffering, a God who is constantly looking for ways to punish people for their sins. These are the people who immediately think they must have done something really terrible if something bad happens to them. If they get in an accident, or they come down with cancer, they think that God must be punishing them for some particular sin. These people don't know that God is a loving God, that God is love, and that Christmas proves it. 
God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. God loved the world so much that he sent his Son to be born in the manger of Bethlehem. God loved you and me so much that he sent his Son to die on the cross to save us from our sins. While God is indeed a holy and a righteous judge, he's also a loving God. God is love, and Christmas proved it. He loved us so much that he sent his own Son to suffer the punishment that we deserve for our sins. In his letter to Titus, as we heard before, Paul says, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God's grace is his wonderful love towards us undeserving sinners. Paul is saying that when Jesus came to this earth, he was an expression of God's love and grace. He was God's love personified. He was the proof, the evidence of God's saving love. On that first Christmas, God's love appeared on this earth in human form. If you ever have doubts about God's love, all you have to do is look at the baby Jesus lying in the manger. And there you have all the proof you ever need of God's love. If you should get in an accident or come down with cancer, you know that God still loves you. He isn't punishing you for your sins. Jesus bore our sins on the cross. God may be trying to train you, he may be trying to teach you something, but he's not punishing you for your sins. You know that God loves you, that he cares for you, that he wants only what is best for you. God loves you, and Christmas proves it. Amen. We sing hymn 56 on page 4. <laughs>
The text for our second meditation is Matthew 1, 22 and 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel. Christmas means that God keeps his promises. Is your life sometimes filled with disappointments and broken promises? Does even your Christmas have some disappointments and broken promises? Perhaps you didn't get many of the things on your Christmas list. Maybe your children promised to visit you but then back down. Even at Christmas, people can let us down and disappoint us. We aren't very dependable, are we? As sinners, we sometimes break our word, we don't keep our promises. We are fickle, we change our minds, we sometimes even forget the promises that we make. We make commitments and don't live up to them. Often we aren't very faithful or trustworthy. But God is just the opposite. He always keeps his promises. He always keeps his word. Matthew reminds us here that the birth of the baby Jesus by the Virgin Mary was in keeping with God's promises. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. He's referring to the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7 that foretells the virgin birth of Jesus. He said that it was going to happen, and it did. On that first Christmas day, God kept his promise. And think of all the other messianic prophecies that God fulfilled in Jesus. Promised that he would be a descendant of David, and he was. Promised that he'd be born in Bethlehem, and he was. Right down to all the details of Jesus' ministry, his suffering, his death, and resurrection. Jesus fulfilled every single one of those messianic prophecies. God was faithful. He kept all his promises. He didn't break a single one. And it all started at Christmas. Christmas means that God keeps his promises. And not just the ones about Jesus and what he would do, but all his other promises as well. God is always true to his word. We can always depend on it. We can put all of our confidence, all of our trust in his word because God is going to do what he said he would do. Just as he kept his promises about the birth of the Savior, so he keeps all his other promises to us as well. When God promises forgiveness of sins to all who trust in Jesus, we know he will keep his word. When he promises eternal life in heaven to all who believe, we know he will keep his word. When he promises to be with us and make all things work for our good, we know that he will keep his word. When he promises to answer our prayers, we know he will keep his word. With the Apostle Paul, we can confidently say, no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes, in Christ. In Christ Jesus and through him, all the promises of God are fulfilled. And it all began with his birth that first Christmas day. Christmas means that God keeps his promises. Amen. We sing hymn 53 on page 5.
The text for our third meditation is Luke 2, verses 13 and 14. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. Christmas means that I have peace with God. People keep on talking as if someday there will be peace on this earth, among the nations of this earth. And they talk as if somehow Christmas can help bring about this earthly peace. Maybe not this year, maybe not in their lifetime, but sometimes they hope there will be peace on this planet. And so in their Christmas messages, church leaders and other world leaders make an appeal for people to live in peace. But it's a futile effort. There will never be peace on this earth. Jesus himself said there will be wars and rumours of wars until the end of time. The peace that the angels sang about over the fields of Bethlehem was not a peace among nations or peace among people, but peace between God and us. They said glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. The peace of which the angels sang is not of our doing, but God's. It's a result of his grace. It's a result of his favour to us. That's why the angels give God all praise and glory. For by nature we are not at peace with God. Like our first parents, we rebel and turn away from God. We constantly sin and go against his holy will. We disobey him and break his commandments. It's not a pretty picture, but it is an accurate one. Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, the sinful mind is hostile to God. By nature we are hostile to God. We are at war with God with no hope of ever being at peace with him. That's why God had to make the first move. We couldn't reach out to him. He had to reach out to us. And he reached out to us in the babe of Bethlehem. That little baby lying in the manger was the Prince of Peace, as Isaiah called him. For on the cross he dealt with our sins that separated us from God. He broke down that wall, that barrier of sin, and reconciled us to God. And so Paul writes to the Corinthians, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Because God sent the Christ child to save us, we are at peace with God. That means that we don't have to be afraid of God, we don't have to be scared of him or frightened of him. Everything is okay between us and God. Everything is all right. We are at peace with God. We are no longer his enemies. We are now his dear children, members of his family, all because of Christmas, all because Jesus was born, to be our peacemaker, to be our mediator. That's why Paul writes to Timothy, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Because we have this peace with God, we can come to him any time in worship and prayer. Because we have this peace with God, we don't have to be afraid of dying. Because we have this peace with God, we know we have eternal life waiting for us in heaven. The Christ child brought us this peace. Christmas means that we have peace with God. Amen. We sing hymn 58 on page 6.
solo angels in your throne on high. Please stand for prayer. Lord God, heaven, Father, Savior, and sustainer of the universe, we praise you for the special love you have shown us, your fallen and sinful creatures. You kept your promises and sent your Son to be born as the promised Savior of the kingdom. Lord Jesus Christ, we marvel at your servant like heart, which moved you to do your Father's will and to take on our flesh. You became fully human so that you might live the holy and perfect life we could not live, endure the agony of the cross, and suffer and die as our substitute. O Holy Spirit, we thank you for your saving work of bringing us to faith in our newborn Savior. You have opened our eyes to see that, despite his humble appearance and lowly circumstances, this child who lies in Bethlehem's manger is the mighty God, the Redeemer of the world. God of our salvation. As you have brought us to faith in the Christ child, so we ask that you would work powerfully also in the hearts of those who do not yet know him or do not know him in truth. Grant that the world's attention to the Christ child may not be only a seasonal attraction or sentimental novelty. Rather, bring sinners to faith that they may see him as the answer to life's problems here and the sure hope of eternal life in heaven with you. Let the joyous message of Christmas be preached in all the world, and may it find ready acceptance in believing hearts for the eternal benefit of our soul, for the extension of your kingdom, and for the glory of your holy name. Amen. We join in the Lord. 